lovely. So now I'm going to, we're going to hand over to our speaker. Bob Reed is cha chairs the Bishop Stalkford Natural History Society. That's a very active society with its own virtual talks program. I'm sure he'll say a little bit more about the society um, just to, when, when he kind of takes over. Um, and it's also great that they've been recruiting new members as well. We just we're having a little chat before we before we started the session about how well that's going. Bob has a particularly uh, special interest in mammals, and he's also got lots of other things that he's involved with as well. So he's the warden of the Sawbridgeworth Marsh Nature Reserve and leader of the National Trust Coppicing Volunteers in Hatfield Forest. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. I'm going to hand you over to Bob for a fascinating talk. So as soon as you're ready, Bob, you can share your screen. Well, good evening, everybody. Um, thank you very much for inviting you me, me to speak on brown hairs. Um, uh, as I said, I'm, I'm chairman of the Bishop Stalford Natural History Society. I, I am a, I'm a general naturalist, really. I, I, I'm not a specialist in any area, but if, if there's anything, it, uh, it's in mammals, uh, which is why I've done this this presentation. So this is the the brown hair biology, ecology, myth, legend, and future. So right, um, oh, wait a minute, minds me. No, it's not running. Let me just. So we've got you. Uh, sorry, we've got this. Your, your slideshow was was come up were you were you having trouble moving on from one slide to the next yeah well, wait a minute, let me just okay just let's just try launching it again from, from the beginning all right we're working now okay yeah. Yeah. so uh, we've all seen brown hairs and the brown hairs we usually see are nearly always running away sometimes some of us get very lucky when hairs have other things on their mind so this is the sort of thing that um, um, people will always associate with, with hairs. Just a little bit to test some of your knowledge, really, before we start. And this is some um, hairs breed only in March. Is that true or false? In fact, it's false. They will breed all the year round, although they are most notable in breeding activity in, in, uh, in March because the, 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 the crops haven't grown up very much. Hairs do not have stereoscopic vision. Can they see in stereo? which is true, they can't. They're, the position of their eyes means they don't have stereo vision. It's a native mammal, true, mm -hmm. true or false. In fact, it's false, it's, it isn't. I'm afraid, I'm afraid I couldn't tell you. It, it isn't, it isn't um, a native mammal. Um, it was thought to have been imported um, probably by the Romans, maybe during the Iron Age. Local name for hair is Sally. I was brought up, my father used to refer to hair as Sally. Mm -hmm. And um, that is thought to be a link with the witchcraft because old Sally was always the witchcraft. Um, so it's true. Hares make a nest for their young, that they don't, as we'll see later on, they don't make any nest at all. Hares sleep with their eyes open. This is a bit of an old wives tale. Um, and the truth is, nobody actually knows. Right, is it a hare or a rabbit? Oh, sorry, is it, is it a hare or a rabbit? Well. Here the, we've got um, a hare, which is obviously much larger than a rabbit, which is much more stocky. The ears are different lengths, um, length of body, uh, the, the length of the legs in particular, the lengths of the, high, of, of, of the hind legs. So the hare is altogether a much bigger, a much bigger animal. Where do they come in classification? Well, they're lagomorphs and they're in the fam. I'm gonna have trouble with the pronunciation of some of these, I'm quite sure. Oconotidae, and they're in the uh, Leporidae, the rabbits and hares, and there's the pikas in there as well. Uh, and in the genus, uh, they are the, uh, the genus Lepus, and there's diff different species of them. There's the Arctic hare, the blue hare, the brown hare, which is what we're concerned with, and, and the cape hare, and some, and some other ones. And, um, um, and so it says, so what is a pika? Now I'm sure that some of you know what a pika is, but we had this question when I did this originally. So there's a pika, a little relative of the brown hare. And I'm sure some of you know much better than I do where, where hares live. Our two native hares uh, is the first one's the Irish hare. And that was shown on, on, on Country File, I believe last weekend, which is a much smaller animal in a kind of brown coat and then 
Sorry, Bob, you've been muted there. Right, there we go. Okay. You all right now? Yes? Yep, that's fine. Uh, the mountain hare, um, which these days is attracting a bit of controversy because um, um, on, on the grouse moors and such like, it looks as if the gamekeepers are doing away with all the predators, which has led to a population explosion of mountain hares. And unfortunately, they're having culls of mountain hares, which seems to be a, a crazy thing to do. But this is the one that turns white in the winter time. Now, I mean, that's locked up again. Why is it? My PowerPoint's locked up again. I'm going to have to. Uh, Bob, if you just click within the window, it should, and then you should be able to go to the. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That's it. Thank you for the advice. Um, right. So the, the the brown hair itself, um, it's larger ears than a rabbit with dark tips. Uh, uh, and rabbits don't have dark tips on their ears, but the ears are altogether larger. Their eyes are, eyes are amber in colour. Their eye, hair's eyes are rather strange things, really. A rabbit's eyes are dark brown. These are scary. A rabbit's eyes are much more welcoming. Much larger body uh, than a rabbit with longer legs in particular. And they tend to walk where rabbits usually hop. Body length, 520 to 595 millimetres. And body weight, quite a big animal, 3.2 to 3.9 uh, kilos so that makes it quite a heavy quite a heavy animal the skeleton is peculiar proportions on the skeleton obviously you've got the the, the very long hind limbs here but there's a, a very strong and substantial backbone because a lot of the spring of the hair is in 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 the musculature ar um, around the backbone large rib cage for the animal as well as we'll see in it. and it's got some of the things i think here here we are large nasal cavity to admit maximum air for the high speed running. They have a shock absorber joint in, in, the, uh, in the skull because when they're running at speed, as you see in a little while, when they're running at speed, it places significant stresses on the animal skeleton. Large heart, making up 1% of the body mass. Large lungs, 1.5% of the body mass. Muscles uh, with, a very, uh, uh, with a very rich supply of, 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 of blood for maximum oxygen. Uh, and um, it's going to put that down. And um, and then we've got the um, hind, hind leg muscles making up 16% of the body mass. And the muscles of the lower back, 9% of the body mass. And the, interestingly, lobe lungs. Their lungs are, are wrapped around their heart for cushioning because once again, when the animal is moving at speed or changing direction, um, or accelerating or decelerating, it places considerable stress on the organs. And um, uh, the, the, the heart is anchored with a tough ligament because once again, um, don't really want the heart to be kind of getting out of control within, uh, within uh, the rib cage. And the forelimb muscles make up 9%. So they're a very, very muscular animal. The, the, the speed at which a hare can run has always been fascination for man and his dogs, unfortunately. Um, they can run at 42 to 45 miles an hour, which is quite fast. If you think about driving a car at 40 miles an hour, and, but they can, uh, they can sustain it for a considerable distance. And um, they, the, how does it, the hare handle such speed? Um, it's, uh, it's acceleration um, is, um, let me get pulled up. Uh, acceleration uh, uh, over over 20 meters, 4.4 meters per second. And uh, Usain Bolt, if you can remember him, can only manage 1.07 meters a second, uh, uh, so a lot faster. Um, and they can decelerate at 5.2 meters a second, enabling them to, to zigzag and jink when trying to escape a predator. Um, there's a definite possibility the hair, the hair could do a wheelie when accelerating. Because they've got such massive hind leg muscles and they take off from a standing start and the definite possibility they could go over backwards. And this is avoided by high torque about the hips, accelerating the center of mass forward. So they, they throw all their weight forward to avoid them going over backwards. Um, when decelerating, it could somersault forward and the front legs and feet are driven hard into the ground and the hips and back feet start to, to, 
uh, lift off. And in this case, center of mass is shifted backwards. While carrying out this maneuver, the hair is very unstable and can easily trip and tumble over violently. And um, unfortunately, when hairs are being traced by dogs, this is something which uh, quite often happens, but it's because the hair is so finely balanced. Uh, the actual muscle power, I'm going to spend too long on this. I'm, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the ba basic muscle structure and the way that you get the different, uh, is going into um, electron microscopy with the different uh, fibrils and such like. And here we see 100 micrometer, the actual muscle uh, fibrils. The hair is, um, the hair, has got um, a, uh, a hairs and are known to have a higher level of N6 PUFAs, they're the polyunsaturated fatty acids in their muscles. And these are essential, um, uh, they are essential fatty acids which they get from the diet, and they are thought in some way to facilitate fast and efficient transfer of oxygen, carbon dioxide. And they're typical of animals with, with, uh, that, that can, run, can run very fast. So a high level of these special fatty acids. It senses, it, sen um, sorry, sorry. Um, it senses, the hair always looks a little bit peculiar really, as you can see. And very noticeably the eyes are actually on the side of their head. Um, some of you may have had the experience of, of, of almost being run into by a hare. And the reason is that hares are as interested in things that are behind them, because that's where a predator is likely to come from, rather than they are um, to actually see what's going on in front. It seems a bit crazy. Their eyes are black and yellow, and they're familiar, but somehow they're strange about them. They've got 360 degree vision, but not forward vision. Lots of rod cells, which gives them very good night vision, but poor color because you can't, as, you, as we know, you can't have the best of both worlds. You can't have both rods and cones. And so the, to get a good uh, night vision, uh, you, you sacrifice it for, for poor color vision. And they've got um, a tapetum lucidum, which means if you shine a light on hairs at night, if you see a pink red glow, it's a hair. And there's the hair, an illustration of the hare's eyes on the side of its head. They've got large curved ears and they, they, they can turn them around to 270 degree turn and they can raise and lower them. And their sound range, 96 hertz to 49 kilohertz, whereas by comparison with us, we can hear somewhat lower, but we can only go up to 20 kilohertz. So they've got very good, they've got very good hearing. Um, good, good sense of taste and smell, and um, important scent glands on the face and around the anus are common with many mammals. The world of scent is very important to them. And they're not vocal. You will not, the only time you'll hear a hare calling out is when it's in pain or it's in agony. Um, and they do that they, because they are at the bottom of the food chain. And the last thing you want to do is to attract predators by being vocal. Their diet. What do they eat? Well, they eat a, a wide range of, um, uh, of, of, of plant material and they need to have access to a range of plant materials in a home range to fulfill their dietary needs. So here are hares feeding. Well, this is feeding in a, uh, in a cereal crop. And this one is feeding on grassland and this one is feeding in what you might consider to be a conservation headland or somewhere like that. So they will, see, they will seek out a, a wide variety of different herbs to make sure they get a good mix of of, uh, uh, of mineral salts, particularly in, in, their, in their diet. Um, the large nasal cavity, huge nasal cavity here, as you can see, if you can imagine the hair's, no, hair's nose on the end here, all this is packed with um, olfactory cells, not only for um, a uh, sense of smell, but also to, to allow maximum entry of air, air to the lungs. So when they're running, they're going to be breathing through their mouth, but equally there'll be a big flow of air through the nasal cavity as well. Uh, and here's this, this flexible joint, it's acts as a shock absorber, so that you can actually, the skull can actually flex slightly at that point. The teeth, um, they are a herbivore, so they've got the continually wearing uh, incisors and also the molar teeth as well. And the diastema, which you'll know uh, from herbivore skulls, where, uh, when they're eating vegetation, 
uh, this will bite off and then the, the vegetation is moved, held in the diastema and then moved gradually through, uh, through the molars. They'll eat a wide variety of plant material. Plant cell is very difficult to digest uh, due to the cellulose cell wall. Um, we're all familiar with, the, with a, a, a plant cell with the chloroplast and the cell wall. And the cell walls, as I'm sorry, cell walls, uh, they're a very tough structure that surrounds and protects plant cells. They give the cells, the, the plant cells, a shape and they're made of cellulose. And, and um, the cellulose cell wall um, it proves to be very difficult to digest. So if, if you uh, look at the structure of the cell wall, uh, you've got the middle of the This is the glue that, that holds one cell uh, uh, to another. Then you've got the primary cell wall, which is where you've got all this pectin, cross-linked glycan, cellulose microfibrils. And it looks very much like the internal girder structure of a bridge or something of that sort. And the plant has to have this to maintain turgor pressure uh, and, and uh, structural stability, but it makes it really difficult for anything to eat it. And here you see it again, all, all the idea of these cross-linked polymers of various sugars um, and proteins. And they're the things that the hair would like to obtain from, from, uh, from its diet, but the fact it's got all this cellulose and pectin and hemicellulose in the, in the way um, makes it really difficult. And when you get lignin added into it, the woody, woody cells added into it, it becomes even more difficult. Um, so they carry out refection, they carry out double digestion of their food. So the, the food will be bitten off, um, but in the incisors, past the diastema to the molars to be ground up. Not aware that they chew the cud, not like not a cattle do, but these will grind the, the plant material up finely. And then uh, the, the herbivore digestive system with a, a very large, very large cecum with a, a, a big bacterial flora. In, in here. So the, um, uh, the food will go, there is, there is as, acid digestion in the stomach, but it will then go down through the, the uh, small intestine and enter into the cecum. And then it will pass through and it will, what they do, just like rabbits do, they produce what's called the cecotrope, which are moist green droppings, and they eat those. So the, 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 uh, the droppings will go through the digestive system twice and they're making use of the, the ability of the bacteria, bacterial flora in the cecum to act on the cellulose and to do the digesting for them because there are no enzymes that mammals produce that can do that effectively. Reproduction, right, bit of a biology lesson. Um, you will remember from biology, I hope, it, this is the ovary and you have the primary follicle that's, uh, that's produced and it gradually develops and inside the follicle, you do have developing the ovum or the egg cell. In, and, and when it matures, you get the mature follicle, it ruptures at ovulation and out pops the ovum and then becomes available for fertilization. Um, the uh, follicle uh, becomes the corpus luteum, uh, which carries out various hormone functions, usually to maintain uh, pregnancy. It's all part of the Easter cycle. Um, and here we've got the, uh, 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 the mammalian reproductive cycle where you've got the ovum being shed from the ovary, passing into the fallopian tube, go, um, where it, if, if the animal has had intercourse, the sperms will carry out fertilization. And then you get the gradual development of the, um, or the morel of the, the, of the ball of cells, uh, eventually into an, um, a blastocyst, which embeds in the wall of the uterus and becomes a embryo proper. Now, hairs are special. They have what's called super uh, fetation. They can get pregnant again before they have had the birth of the existing litter. It's a kind of conveyor belt of, um, uh, of production. And no wonder they were seen as a picture of fit, uh, uh, fit, fertility and fecundity. Um, here is the, the, um, the cycle of, of the rabbit. The rabbit will ovulate. It, the ovum will get fertilized in the oviduct, rabbit becomes pregnant, goes uh, uh, through gestation, and the young are born after 30 days. Then it goes through the same cycle again. The hares ovulate and it gets fertilized, and a, a first pregnancy starts, 
But this pregnancy is long. It actually goes on for 42 days as opposed to the rabbit's 30 days. But during the latter part of it, um, the young are really getting very well developed. And it's at that time that the hair will ovulate again and she will, she will get pregnant for the second time. So all the while she's got this overlapping cycle. These young will be born and at the same time, these will be coming along and then she will, uh, she will mate again. And there's, there will be this, con this conveyor belt of um, a reproduction, which is why we think of only reproducing in March, but they don't, they reproduce as long as conditions are right through the year. I don't think it's gonna spend too long on that. This is some um, ultrasound of, of uh, this is where the evidence has come from uh, for that. The female repels a male if she's not ready to mate and the, the hair's boxing. It's nothing to do with getting in the ring with each other. It's the female repelling the male. And um, in, in fact, as we all know, that they, they mate very frequently. Um, I wonder who these, who all these guys must all be chasing. This isn't my picture. It's a very interesting one, isn't it? Um, and um, uh, they are all wanting to mate basically. And she will only ovulate after copulation. Uh, that is the stimulus for the next of uh, the next ovulation, and and they are at it all the year if possible. Now the result of that comparison of newly born rabbits on the left, pink and completely helpless and blind, after thirty days, whereas after forty two days, here are the leverets born, ready to go, um, little tiny, cute little things. They are very very vulnerable but they are precocial, um, they're, ready, uh, they're ready to go. Uh, and and the, the, the female hair will leave these young uh, in the form, I've got, I've got a picture of some forms, that's the hollow in the ground where they lie, and she will leave these young in, the, in her form and she will, will go away and feed and she doesn't pay any attention to them what's at all. When she comes back, she'll come back at night to feed them and she creates a scent maze by a series of prodigious leaps in all directions, makes it almost impossible for a predator to find the true scent line. If you want to read an interesting book on hares by uh, Tregarthen, The Life Story of a Hare, and it was a book that he wrote before uh, The Life Story of an Otter, which is what Henry Williamson is thought to have taken as a pattern for Tarkaby Otter, but The Life Story of a Hare is based all on the Land's End Peninsula, and he must have really watched hares, and he describes the way a hare will uh, create a scent maze by leaping all over the place to, uh, so it's very, almost impossible for a predator to follow a line to go straight to the young. And she will suckle the young in the dark and notice she's sitting upright to do it. And um, because she is worried, <laughs> she's got all these babies here and, uh, and, and she, um, she needs to keep her, uh, she needs to keep listening and she needs to keep watching as well. So she suckles them and then she will leave them. And what they will do, they will just disperse. Uh, and on their understanding that if a, a fox or whatever gets one, then it will miss the other ones. They're precocial, born ready to go after a long gestation, like so many um, uh, chicks are born. Um, they rely, rely solely on hiding um, in animation, don't move an almost negligible scent production to evade predators. And um, people usually go, ooh, when you show these pictures. Um, but there they are, uh, these are leverets. So they're, so they're highly, highly vulnerable, but they are at the bottom of the food chain. It is their role in life to uh, provide uh, nutrient power up the food chain. Um, they have lots of enemies. They're particularly vulnerable. And if they, but, but if they survive, they may live to be three or four years old. Fox is the main enemy of the adult, stoats and weasels, uh, the, the buzzard, uh, 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 crows, members of the corvid family, uh, badgers, particularly good at scenting out ones. And in, hares are interesting. If you try hare watching, um, you quite often, if you're aware with our hares, you will almost tread on a hare before they jump up. I'm sure some of you had that experience. They lie absolutely flat on the ground and their ears are flat, but their eyes, being the position they are, are watching. They'll be watching and they lie flat down right on the ground like this and uh, rely on that as a, a, as a, um, 
as a defense really they spend a lot of time grooming to keep their feet in particularly good condition after all it will be the one thing they rely on to escape from a, a predator and um, um, is, we've got surprisingly long long digits as you can see but this animal is grooming keeping its feet clean because on on muddy soil they're quickly going to get dirty and bunged up they are prone to diseases um, grass sickness leperine whatever that is total breakdown of the nervous system thought to be linked with toxins in the grass and it, it's something which horses it's something which horses get as well and um, they are prone to coccidiosis bacterial disease and what happens with that is the infected animal can be a hare or a rabbit will pass uh, uh, the non-infected oocysts and they develop they are they get uh, uh, it, it, these are these are domestic rabbits but it could be on grass or vegetation get ingested and, and it goes around like that um, they're prone to, to nematode worm gut parasites here are the nematodes um, which, which a lot of mammals seem to get those water voles on my nature reserve uh, 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 their droppings are riddled with nematode worm gut parasites but with an animal that's not got a very long life it probably isn't going to be of much consequence the european brown hair um, uh, uh, there's a, a syndrome one of these conditions is not fully understood viral hemorrhagic condition causing internal bleeding a horrible horrible viral disease and they're also um, subject to yersinia as well so there's a whole lot of things that they are subject to disease wise uh, like the ecology, they have a home range of a few fields and they don't range far and wide. So here are the home ranges of, of, of three hares on farmland. The red line is the actual home range, which it will hardly go outside. The red dots are where it rests up during the daytime and these circles are where it, uh, where it goes to feed. But it won't travel hardly outside of its, of its home, home range. And the effect of modern farming practices, well, we can possibly forecast what that's going to be. This is um, a Dorset farm in the 1940s on the left with the network of fields and hedgerows and woodlands. Um, by the time it gets to the 1980s, um, they've knocked out lots of the hedges and you've got huge areas of, um, of cereals. And um, their figures were in the, in the 1940s, this farm had approximately 40 hares per hectare, whereas in the 1980s it had fewer than 10. So this is a familiar pattern in the countryside, isn't it? This is um, a farm near to Sawbridgeworth, where I'm coming from, uh, is uh, where I did a study of hares. And this is a, um, a, a, a farm where the farmers are quite environment. They, it is commercially farmed, but they do a lot for wildlife. So they've got permanent pasture. They've got a woodland belt. They've got game strips. This is a game strip just growing here. And they've got hedges and farm tracks, which are, which are maintained for conservation. So they've got margins. So all, all this adds up to good hare habitat. And they grow spring barley. And all the fields have wide grass margins. So this is the sort of thing, that if you want to encourage hare, the sort of things you need to do. So um, uh, this is little, I'm going to probably going to hur hurry this through because I'm aware of the time. Let's put that up there. And um, um, this is a little bit of film in May, um, hiding in the hedge and doing a bit of filming with video camera, red leg partridge, cock, cock pheasant. Cock, we, we just let the cock pheasant do his display because that's really good. I did wonder actually how close he was going to walk to me. He must have seen another cock pheasant, I think, because all of a sudden. There we are. <laughs> right. Move it. And, and also on the field as well, stock doves at feeding. I've been putting up barn owl nest boxes today, and these quite commonly get stock doves in them. And here is a fox which is bringing, I hope it's a young rabbit. <laughs> I hope it's not a hare. But it's bringing um it's obviously caught obviously caught something 
take into the cubs and it must be May because of the um, the hawthorn all on bloom. And here's coming up to the hares in a minute, I'm hoping. Here we are, here are some hares feeding on the field in front of me. Uh, this is the spring barley and um, they've come out in the evening to, to feed. And uh, that typical walking motion rather than rather than uh, rather than hopping. Right, I'm going to go on to the next slide, if I can. Right, this is um, this is uh, thermal imaging at night, um, going out onto farmland at night with a thermal imaging device to see what's happening. And surprise, surprise, there's hares running around all over the place. And because hares are um, obviously warm-blooded, um, their ears show up particularly well and their leg muscles show up particularly well, as you can see. And the, the field is covered in hares pursuing each other. And um, uh, yeah, here's one that got left behind. <laughs> right, I'm going to move on. Right, hare watching. If you decide to go hare watching, you've got to find your hares, first of all. So you need to be able to interpret footprints. So um, we've got on the, on the left, we've got rabbits, footprints, and they've all got hairy feet. But what is, because the rabbit is hopping, here are the fore feet and here are the hind feet. So you get this typical in snow, or particularly best in snow, but a hare has got huge, great feet, huge, great hairy feet. And because it's got this kind of lolloping gait, you get this pattern rather than the hopping pattern. So that's something to look out for. And um, uh, you can find, you sometimes find rabbit uh, fore feet prints, but you find it very difficult to get hair prints. But what you do get with hairs are the forms in stubble. And this is where hairs have just simply scraped out a hollow and they flatten themselves in there and they will um, uh, um, be virtually invisible until you tread on them. And it's more comfortable, it's out of the wind as well. They have regular tracks, but their large soft feet leave little evidence. This is a badger, a badger path here, and the badger comes thumping along there every night. The hare, by uh, comparison, here is a hare track here, and it's, hard, it's hardly visible. And there's another one here. You have to get your eye in to, to actually see where they're going. And the uh, this is an old poacher's term, a smile or muse, where they used to set their nets. And here is, here is one of those here going through there and another uh, sorry, and um, another one so they they you have to be quite a good quite a good nature detective here's one crossing going through there another one there and one up the bank right a little bit about the the history and the, um uh, they have been known by man for a long time these uh, magdalenian cave etchings 17000 to 12000 years before present in the dodoenia people were, were sketching hairs on the cave wall. It, they turn up in Egyptian hieroglyphics um, and um, in all sorts, of, all sorts of symbols. And they are an animal that's been revered and had godlike status for a long time. The Greeks associated them with, Cubid, uh, with Cupid um, and here's a hair being carried and uh, 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 Cupid carrying a hair assumes a feminine aspect. And here's another one here. And, and yet another one. So they've almost given like a godlike um, or religious significance. And they are associated with the spring goddess, Istra. And typically our pagan forebears were quite keen on fertility symbols, as you can see. And this didn't really go down too well with the Christian community. So they decided to turn Istra into Easter. And they turned, um, they turned the goddess Istra into the Easter bunny, which was a lot less harmful than a fertility symbol, which is what the hare was originally. St. Melangel, daughter of an Irish king, was a hermit in Wales. A hunted hare hid under her robes and she refused to allow it to be killed. And so she became the she patron saint of rabbits, St. Melangel, and there's her church down in... Uh, um, in, 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 in Wales. The other interesting thing, this is the, the shaman tradition of hares, why hares are associated with a, with a witch, because people thought that, um, um, that, that, uh, that witches could transform themselves backwards and forwards into a, into a hare. And this was the, this was the, 
way that they would have assumed it being done. And um, hares were also always associated with a full moon because you could see them on a full moon. So they, once again, they got this sort of mystical aspect to them. The other interesting thing is called the, the hare uh, triscale. Always three hares perpetually running back to back with linked ears. Origin and tradition are known, found in many cultures, adopted as the Holy Trinity by Christianity. And here, it, these are all triskeels. This looks like Greek, possibly, I'm not sure. And um, you get them in uh, um, walls, of, in, in windows, in churches. And in Dartmoor, you get what's called Tinner's Rabbits. And they, they are carved into the roof bosses on, on, in the roofs of churches. So nobody really knows what the Triscale is all about. It's a mythical symbol. There we are. It's, a, it's another one, the carved into carved into roof bosses. They've always been associated with fertility and fecundity. And uh, in a way, it's given the hair a bit of a bad name. And um, you can see that there's a hair here uh, in a, a kind of fecund, fertile situation there. The shape of the hair can be seen on the moon. I don't know how many of you seen the shape of the hair on the moon but if you look there's the shape of the hair on the moon and people would have seen that and, and hairs seem to be active on full moon night and so do the witches and the occult which is where the where the connection comes in and the japanese take particular notice of the moon hair and it's found in many cultures so the hairs mysteriously tend to be about on moonlight nights Man's hunted hare since time immemorial. Not a great sport. The hare will not leave its home range. Hare population sometimes rise dramatically, especially the fox population has been removed, giving rise it was for a cull. Um, uh, poachers uh, uh, with lurcher dogs, unfortunately, quite a bit of this still goes on these days. Uh, beagles were bred with short legs um, because it's no, that would make it more difficult for them to catch the hare. Um, and Hair coursing, unfortunately, this is a time of year for hair coursing when hares um, are, or, or when greyhounds are, are run against hares, wild hares, and bets are placed. Very, very unpleasant. And this is a hair shoot, um, a cull of hares. Almost certainly, I know from my own experience locally, where gamekeepers kill all the foxes, you get a population explosion of hares, and then farmers start to complain about the damage that hares are doing to a crop and we'll say oh two hares eat the same as one sheep in a day and so you have a a, a hair hair cull the, the the pattern of population variation and decline is interesting particularly this one here 1900 in world war one the hares shot per 100 hectares it went up um, and it, but, but it's unsure why why this was. And there was a farm in recession. It went up again. It, it is believed that during these times people were actually eating a lot more hares because food was less available. Then they were living off the land a lot more. When myxomatosis came along and killed all the rabbits off, the population of hares uh, increased because there was more food available. So the actual popula population dynamics over the years has, has changed a lot. But you'll see, unfortunately. The downward trend, as in so many things, is downward since it's up to 2000. How can they be helped in the future? There's no co there's no close season for hares, and the hare seasons often hare shoots often have in February, killing pregnant females and making leveret orphans. And here's the re results of a hare shoot, and all the poor dead hares all laid out. Um, encouraging farmers going to high level stewardship to promote grass margins of biodiversity, this sort of thing is all very, very helpful, making ideal hare habitat. I encourage planting a wide variety of herbs and grasses in, in areas like that. Tighter regulation on illegal coursing and lamping. Um, on some farms, ha hares are lamped out to discourage illegal coursing and the crime that frequently comes with it later on because people who go illegal coursing will have a little look around while they're on farm then where they shouldn't be. And then they come back and break in places later on. So do farmers will sometimes kill all the hares, which seems a tragic thing to do. Um, forest harv uh, uh, forage harvesting for silage uh, is terribly damaging to leveret populations because the, 
forage harvester sculpts off all the grass and you can imagine that they would well there could well be lots of leverets in a field like this and I'm afraid they all end up getting chopped up and end up in the silage pit proper survey of live hares so the true position is known nearly all the data comes from dead hares and opportunities to, uh, to promote and this, uh, these are hare watching in some wildlife reserves there are hare watching areas where you can pretty well guarantee that hares will be finally it's time to say good day to use the hare much remains unknown about the hare they retain the strangeness that we cannot fully fathom out a welsh farmer once made the remark that a hare as someone has said is a hare and that's the end of it hares are animals we have never been able to hold completely they cannot be domesticated. Their ability to turn suddenly, execute its mazes, to accelerate or swerve out of the neat grid of classification, to disappear through an opening, its smile or muse that the classifier has neither noticed nor suspected. If a hare is given the slenderest of chances, it will escape in a way which is, which is often to us beyond reason. And it's this ability of a hare to apparently appear out of nowhere and to disappear, which is giving it quite a lot of the mystique. Why are they attracted to airdromes, often fatally? Are they bold or a timid creature? Sometimes they appear to be very cunning and clever. At other times, they appear totally stupid. We may never understand. There's some hair has been particularly stupid, as you can see. And um, why I mean, some of you still, on the first day of the month, insist on saying rabbits? I, I mean, I was taught to do it by my parents. And I know other people do it. But why we do that on the first day of the month, who knows? But here we are, that's the end of the presentation and the end thing on the hairs. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Bob. That was absolutely fascinating. You packed such a lot in and you, you basically just covered so much about hairs, much of which I did not already know. And I've got a kind of newfound respect for them really. And I do hope we can kind of you know, move forward in terms of their conservation and, you know, and be a bit less destructive towards them. Um, it's good that there were some sort of signs of that. I saw how busy the chat has been. So there's lots of people saying what a fascinating talk and thank you so much. We've also got lots of questions. So we, if you are you OK if we go straight over to picking up a few of those questions now? I, I will do my best. I'm not an expert, but I will do my best. <laughs> Lovely. Of course, that's fine. That's and, you know, yeah. OK, so Anka, are you, are you OK to, to pick up a few questions for us? Yeah, it's like you said, it's been really, really busy <laughs> on the chat. Um, so there are quite a few questions. Um, so I'll just kind of start from the top. Um, so Liz was wondering, do hares store red blood cells in the spleen for extra running capacity like horses? Uh, all, all I can say is that, that I don't know of the blood volume of a hare, but they do have, they, they do have a large blood volume. Um, and uh, it's a, once again, it's a bit sad, but the, the, there is a dish called jugged hare, and the, the hare is actually cooked in, in blood, in its own blood, basically, because they, they're, 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 um, their muscles are so richly endowed with blood, and, and I suspect they may have not only haemoglobin, but also myoglobin as well to help as an oxygen, as an oxygen store. So I can't give you a figure, but, I, but they, they, are, they do have a high blood volume. Well, I'm, I don't think that's a meal I'm going to try. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, Matthew was wondering, it's a completely different question. Um, why do they nip the tops out of young tree seedlings and saplings and often leave it lying on the ground? I've seen this damage along rows of trees and new planting if unprotected. I, th I think that it's quite, it quite often happens in the springtime of the year, doesn't it? Um, in Hatfield Forest, it, that's the time of the year that you get damaged by rabbits and, and hares. And uh, uh, it, is, it is a time when the sap is coming up. And, uh, and that means that they're, they're, it will probably be particularly nutritious after a long winter of eating horrible low level nutrition, vegetation, dry vegetation. Uh, you get this new flush of growth then they will bark strip and uh, uh, whether they just eat the shoots off and eat some of them and drop the other ones i don't know but that's the only reason i can think that they, it will be nice tender young nutritious growth at that time of the year okay um and 
a slightly different question. Will a hare eat another hare's or rabbit's droppings for nutrition? Well, I don't think anybody's done an in-depth investigation on that one. Really. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if, if, if you keep domestic rabbits, you'll, you'll know that, that, that they are remarkably private about this activity. Mm. Uh, and um, uh, so it isn't something that, um, and I, I also think I'm right in saying it's done, it's done at night when they're, all these animals live a life of fear and um, that they need to make themselves least vulnerable. And so it's a practice, so I, I honestly don't know. I, I wouldn't think so, no, because as I understand it, when the cecotrope is expelled from the anus, the animal eats it immediately. But it's yeah. nice, nice and warm still. I mean, we actually have a rabbit and I've never seen this, no. you know, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, there we are. There's an area of investigation there for somebody, isn't there? Yeah, yeah. I've got my daughter on it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, now here's, I mean, Here's another one. Do hares ever turn carnivore if starvation becomes apparent? I, I've not heard anything of it. We, we do hear stories of, um, uh, we know that the, the, the smaller rodents will, will eat, uh, certainly mice will eat other dead mice and rats will certainly eat mice, dead mice. I, I've never heard of it. I've never heard of any, in, you'd think really, I mean, I've been out and about in the countryside all my life, and I've never heard any story. And you'd think, if that was so, people would have people would have know about it. Um, is typically um, the, the, these things come about because if one animal, and once again, unfortunately, and it goes on, if an animal gets trapped, uh, uh, another animal may come along and find a, a meal there ready. And you know, in nature, any any nutrition is worth having. But I'm certainly not aware. I've never heard of anything. With regard to or, um, or rabbits either no but uh, but mice certainly rats so i think they've probably got rather better dentition for dealing with meat um but uh, no i have not heard of that no <laughs> um are hares found on every continent they probably are actually um they probably are because that list of hares the list of the different, you know, they, they will be different species of hares or different varieties of hares. But if you think about it, the Arctic hare and Cape hare, I think they probably are. I think they probably are. I mean, they, I don't think, I'm not aware of them being introduced into Australia. Uh, uh, I mean, um, we introduced a lot of unfortunate things into Australia, didn't we? But I'm not, not aware of hare, haven't heard of hares being, uh, being introduced to, uh, to Australia. So I think they probably are uh, on, on most continents with the exception of one or two like that, yes. Okay, yeah, I'm just kind of thinking of Antarctica as well. It might be. <laughs> uh, well, well, well there's, there, there is the Arctic hare, you see. Yeah. So, but, um, I mean, you, you don't see them. I don't recall David Attenborough showing a shot of a, of a but there certainly are Arctic, uh, Arctic hares, yes. Um, there were a few questions on um, the reproduction habits. Um, I think the fact that um, female hares are able to have two pregnancies at a time, um, yes. quite um, uh, a lot of people were very interested in that. So there are a couple of questions that are related. Um, Tessa was wondering why do hares and rabbits manage to have two pregnancies at a time, but other herbivores presumably don't? And Ellen was um, asking, why does Ms. Hare not expel half-grown fetuses along with the ready-to-go leverets? Yes, yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, as, as, as I would understand it, um, I think probably um, the, uh, the uterus is Y-shaped with two ovaries. And I suspect that they kind of take it in turn. Uh, so, so I suspect that, that, that you have got one uterine horn, which is dealing with the pregnancy that's going on and the other uterine horn will have got the developing pregnancy inside it. So it, they, I have a feeling they work alternately, basically. And, and what was the first, uh, the, the first part of it? Was... Um, why do hares and rabbits manage to have two pregnancies uh, at a time, but other herbivores presumably don't? I, I think that they, um, it, it is a big, for far as most herbivores are concerned, uh, all animals are concerned, it's a big strain uh, maintaining a fetus and bringing it to full term. And so they will tend to in, put all their investment into taking great care in one or possibly two, whereas 
animals like hares and 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 rabbits um, are are capable. They're going to have a good, usually a good food supply freely available, and so that, that w w w w while the resources are there, but then they will breed, um, and uh, it's just something they do. But it but but uh, once again, for a female to maintain um, a cycle like that, uh, um, the superfetation must place a major strain on the female's body I would have would have thought it, 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 it must reflect the, the the nature of the diet that they must be having a good diet to be able to do that and they must be able to extract good level of nutrition from their diet as well yeah um so how many leverets can they have at a time and what is the survival rate of the leverets that they they can have up to about four at a time the survival rate is poor, very, very poor. Um, there, I have actually, I have got some figures somewhere for that, but they um, uh, pr probably maybe one out of the four will survive. Probably, it's a bit like badger cubs. You know, badgers have three cubs, and you expect one to get through to the following year. There, there's always going to be mortality in, in young like that, but but particularly from leverets, um, there are so many predators about ready to make a meal of a tender leveret. Um, I mean, a buzzard flying over a field, you know what buzzard's eyesight uh, must be like. And even if the, even if the lever is staying stock still, then, and badgers are, are very, very good at, at um, their tremendous sense of smell that they've got at, at finding that sort of thing. So yes, it, 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 it um, the survival rate is low. And I think it's probably something like one in four. Oh. We're going to um, maybe just have time for one more question. I know there are lots of questions in the chat, but if we just pick one last one up to finish on Anka. Yeah, I'll just, um, John, well, this is kind of then talking about the toxins and, and diseases that the hares get. So there were actually a couple of, well, a number of questions, but one was where do the toxins in the grass come from? And also, do they get um, myxo um, myxomatosis? I can't say this word. The disease they get from the fleas. <laughs> um, I, I think the grass sickness. Uh, the grass sickness is is one that affects horses as well. And um, once again, I don't think anybody fully understands. It's to do with the physiology of the animal. Um, you know, in the early part of the season, um, the the growing grass often. Um, is poor in nutrients is growing so rapidly with the lengthening of the days and the, the rising temperatures and it, it, it is deficient in things like magnesium and so on and they're all very essential for the proper physiology of the animal's body and and, and so that must be but but certainly the grass sickness is is really really not but it isn't it isn't a toxin coming out of the air or anything like that it's actually in the in the in the grass itself which is why they give animals um, like that, why, why they give them uh, salt and mineral licks and that sort of thing to, uh, to make sure that their, their immune systems are fully boosted indeed. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Yeah. So um, we're gonna need to wrap up now, which is a bit sad because I'm sure we could carry on talking for a very long time. I do want, a lot of people have popped in the chat, they want the details of the book that you mentioned. And if there's anything else that you can suggest that people might read, to follow up. So do you mind just letting us know the, the name of the book and the author again? Oh, the, what, the book by the hair? Yeah, the, the one about the, the one that you, yeah, that you mentioned. Um, Tregarthen, um, T-R-E-G-A-R-T-H-E-N, and it's the life story of a hare. Thank you. Um, I'm yeah. Just, yeah, I can see it here somewhere. But I'm <laughs> Got a copy there. <laughs> <laughs> I like your collection generally of books. It looks fantastic. Yeah. But yeah, so that's, that's is that that's basically what you'd recommend if people want to. Well, well, it's a very it's an old book, but it is a very interesting book because, as I say, this guy wrote this uh, about this hare that lived on the Lands End Peninsula, and he very well portrays the life of fear that this hare led. Um, how it would return to its form and how it would would be watching and listening for the farmer's dog down in the valley and all that sort of thing yes so if you can get hold of it it's going to be a library book I think probably um, it's well worth reading yeah to Garson. Thank you. That's great. And uh, just to say once again, what a fantastic talk that's been. There's been so much appreciation 
from um, people in the chat. Uh, it, you know, it was just a really fascinating, and I'm glad we've recorded it because I think it's going to be something that a lot of people will want. Some people could make this evening, um, and I certainly would like to watch it again as well because it was just so, covered so much in a really fascinating way. So thank you again for coming along, for agreeing to talk to us, and for delivering such a wonderful talk.